Hello, my name is Michael Dexter, and I will be talking about parallel multi-access regression and performance testing with FreeBSD, OpenZFS, and Beehive. I will first define axes, and that's in the mathematical sense. I will talk about the requirements for each, and some lessons learned from each. I've definitely not covered all the territory I've mapped out, but there are lessons to be learned at every turn. The ultimate goal is to provide full test coverage to all possible axes now that machines are affordable and virtualizable and all these wonderful new technologies we have before us. So I often get asked, why are you all over the map? And my answer is because it's all interrelated. All of it, every bit of it, everything I do, every event I put on, every talk I give, every technology I tinker with, they're all intertwined. So, acute motivations. Uh, if you caught Chuck's talk on NVMe and Beehive, he went into spectacular depth on some techniques for finding uh, pathological behavior on NVMe and simulating it, which is very handy. The libc tell deer bug, this is a bug I chased for nine months that involved lumber counters and electron microscopes where when the lumber flies by with a barcode and a machine photographs it, a JPEG image flies off to a storage system. And it fills up really quickly. And the same goes for the folks with electron microscopes taking pictures of silicon wafers flying by, because they fly by all day and night. And there were some performance cliffs on various storage systems that would hit a certain number of files and drop in performance, so that what normally would take a second would take a minute, an hour, a day in time. So, that one was a very visceral educational experience for me. <clears throat> Moving on to various performance cliffs that people see with whatever workload they bring to the table, various device failure scenarios that Chuck beautifully talked about earlier, and naturally the desire for open ZFS everywhere, which goes right down to the recordings of BeehiveCon on my little Zoom recorders, which have FAT32, and chunk up the recording sessions in like little blocks of segmented files, and no, I want a big file for editing, so there's no little hiccup in between, etc., etc. I was reminded of that this week. And multi-path surprises, which I won't go too deep into, but um, I will touch on some nice technologies from some of the folks in the room who have facilitated that work. So, the axes I will be talking about, and these are, oh, not super formal, but they work for me. The architect architecture axis, the open ZFS and operating system access, because for my work, they're one and the same. If it's on my radar, it's supporting open ZFS, and that's getting pretty interesting at these, in these times. The hypervisor access, which used to be quite simple, but now there is a lovely prolifer proliferation of hypervisors. It's almost one announced every few months. Wonderful. The threads access, which is very OS specific, but we, and hypervisor specific, I'll touch on that briefly. The version access, which is the most accessible. Gee, stuff comes in versions, and there's the, the old one, the new one, and the upcoming one. And <clears throat> the devil's in the details in those. The compiler access, which doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but all this stuff is automatable. So if you have several compilers at your disposal, it costs very little to aim them at your software. The options access, which is very specific to one OS, and I'll touch on that, but it does apply to other OSs in various ways. And Surprisingly integrated to all of this is the BSD cons access because it, it sets out a schedule for many of us over the year. More motivations. Um, architectures. The, I believe one of the earliest Berkeley motivations was to have a common platform for government contractors to have on whatever hardware with one OS. Great. Well, nobody wants a tier two or tier three architecture. And we have various talks this week about, say, PowerPC. It's still a thing, and there's some neat new hardware coming out. But if it's been neglected for years on end from the software side, and then great hardware comes along, you have a catch-up period. And so, in a perfect world, uh, legacy architectures, unless absolutely available, would be kept up to date in some specific way. And new architectures, like all these ARM boards that cost very little and are you know, available relatively plentifully uh, should be brought to a tier one status as quickly as possible, because people just want their stuff to work. And similarly with OpenZFS, 
What's the one rule in file systems? Anyone? Don't lose data. Don't lose data. So uh, tier two file system platforms are a terrifying notion. It's like, well, this one works great. We lose data on these four. <laughs> like, that's bad. <laughs> that's really bad. And you get one chance with customers, developers, you name it. You, you burn their data. They remember that. It's the darnest thing. So I consider it very important that as new ZFS platforms arrive, and I'll be talking about, I believe, all of them. Uh, maybe not Haiku, but uh, I think it's very important that they all get equal attention. And the hypervisor access, uh, I've spent a long, enough time with that that I look at any given guest machine. It's a block device, a RAM allocation, and some network stuff, and that's what they all look like. And you can generally take a raw block device and plug it into any virtualization solution and get somewhere to some degree. So keeping them fundamentally portable is a good thing in my humble opinion. And we'll talk about the threads access, which uh, is a peek at the future when we get lots and lots of cores very affordably, which was not something we all considered long ago when we all started at this. So the version access, uh, we all live in some of the, the, the current status of any given operating system or third party software, while some go way back in history. And some are surprisingly given flack for doing that until it's cool and they're like, wow, it's retro computing. It's like, That's so cool that you brought back this whole thing. And it was just a talk on the backs that, in the other room, which is great. And all the issues one faces here and now with that. Uh, compilers. If you're open source, your source code's available, it's compliant with standard, published standards like C99, you name it, whatever. You have multiple compilers at your disposal, why not aim them at it? See if your code is compliant with this standard as claimed, or if your compiler is compliant, compliant with a standard as claimed. So I don't think it's harmful to get too religious about compilers and disregard certain ones that are at your disposal. So just my opinion. The options access, I'll talk about that specifically about the modularity of Unix and how it's actually a really good thing. And the BSD cons access that I touched on briefly, well, it does structure the work of a lot of us because we're volunteering. We're, we're here just to forward our work for the community. The architectures access. So I focused on, like most, uh, what's considered Intel x86, in this case, Xeon E3 machines. And the pile of, of ARM boards on my desk have not integrated into all of this. I do have some, some nice ARM progress to talk about for, in my own little lab. Uh, I offered my IA64 machine to Theodore Rapp. It was like the length of that table. And he said, no. And I'm like, OK, it's a new condition for Intel. I can cross the town to Hillsborough. But it went back to recycling. Probably will not be on my horizon. I do have my Xeon i386 server out in the data center. I might bring that into the mix. Yes, there's i386 Xeon. PowerPC, you'll see in a photo, there are some PowerPC machines at our disposal. And they're new. I went to supercomputing and saw the new machines available. And it's very impressive. And uh, the Kibitz, who's doing work on them, is great. Exciting stuff. Spark 64, it's still a thing. Reliable, noisy hardware, I've got some of it, and offers of more because most folks are willing to just give it to you. It's kind of cool. At least it's broad news. And RISC V is very exciting given all news topics relating to CPUs over the years, be it security, be it licensing, be it you name it. That's an exciting uh, opportunity, I'll say. And there are conferences going on, and I hope someone's got one of those high five boards and will at least show it at the next event, you name it. So. Is anyone familiar with HPZ workstations? They are popular among engineers. And engineers pound on them pretty hard. Or maybe bank receptionists, whatever, bank, bank clerk, clerks, etc. Engineers cycle through them quite quickly. And even though it's a gamer-friendly gamer machine, most folks don't know what to make of them. So they're very, very affordable. And often there are decent configurations, which are suitable for what I'm doing. And thank you very, very much to the person on the next slide for donating an OverDrive 1000. It's an uh, ARM64 machine that might be discontinued. It's hard to tell reading the tea leaves. But it's been popular among the BSDs for building packages. And quotation from 
Azure BSD Con. Oh, I've never seen those machines I keep logging into for building packages for OpenBSD. Cool. And they're a thing. And they're a few hundred dollars rather than Capium Thunder X2 prices, which is sort of the ultimate goal, but we're all waiting for those to come down to those prices and then a secondhand market, you name it. So, regarding these machines, I am paying between $120 and $150 for an Xeon E3 that is compact. You can bring the fans down if you've got quite a cool enough storage. <clears throat> I noticed that NetBSD needs its own video card, but hey, I've got 10 of them lined up, and having a platform like that uh, in my multi-decade time in the community is revolutionary, because I could have dreamt about that, but it would have cost you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm glad someone else spent the money and let it depreciate. So, Overdrive 1000 for what it's worth. They're serial only, but with a built-in adapter, which is kind of cool. Uh, there is no PCIe slot. That would be very cool. There's a small bug in 12 release that I've been talking to Manu about. You need to load open solaris.ko and set it in the loader and you'll be fine. But it does have a generic, a, the experience we all want. You take a generic OS installation, not a dedicated OS, a machine specific one, boot to the USB, install it, reboot, you're, you're there. The Zen folks have been hardware surprise rebooting theirs at length. They may have, they may have bias corruption issues related to that. Uh, don't look up the power to expose. Very nice. Moving on. When, if you can, once you establish a stable platform of identical machines, you slowly work your way up in the stack and get to say, okay. Don't benchmark with DD, but it's a useful little tool and has its place. And so let's look at what do you do if you just run some DD on OSs, even just going from dev zero to null. And when you're trying to achieve a POSIX environment across very, very different OSs, you're often very limited to the tools available to you. So jumping into some numbers, very simple test because one thing uh, I would like to do a lot with memory disks, simply because they're predictable. You can have a lot of them for zero additional cost, sort of just the resources needed to make them available. And suddenly you think, OK, while these are all uh, Xeon E3 machines, there is the one ARM machine, apples and oranges. But OK, it, it's, it has a dramatic difference, if you will, over, over double the time it takes to do the simple operation. I know it's not very scientifically exciting, but but at the low end, hey, you take the resources you have. I'm surprised by CentOS. But the eye opener here was when you get into, like, say, dev random. You think, oh, I'll throw some random data from point A to point B. Your eyes get open very quickly when, okay, very efficient, you know, uh, entropy generation, etc. But I didn't read the warnings about CentOS, which apparently takes a very long time to generate entropy. And you simply have very little use of the random device until fully warmed up, and it just wouldn't produce results. <laughs> Can't be right, but no, in fact, that's right. And I, I fully appreciate that. Okay, it needs proper warming, great. But if you're doing virtual machines that come up and down and, and are, are evaporating in front of you, you actually really want some solid entropy from day one, from second one. And kudos to the OpenBSD folks who are looking at this from a boot perspective on, on up that no matter what you do, you should have entropy at your disposal. <clears throat> uh, 120 seconds, we'll get to why what's going on there. Uh, Windows 10, 10 minutes, I was like, wait, what? But then, okay, you random. Ah, and a more efficient random. Some have a, a traditional uh, random number generator, garbage generator, and so, okay, numbers are more predictable. Still a little surprised at Mac OS, we can have a conversation afterward, but uh, ARM machine, okay, yeah. it's providing meaningful randomness, fine, give it time. You random on Windows, blew away everyone else. Suddenly it, okay, exact opposite, pleasant surprise. So first off, don't do what I initially did, which is just aim while doing building infrastructure, just do completely random, dev random, and get results that have nothing to do with the file system you are testing based on that. So if you base your results on that, you know, random device performance, your, your results are meaningless. And I'm sure Nat has a lot to say about this. Yes, 
You'll come up later, don't worry. Fine, you keep that zero. It's great on CFS. You get great performance. Yeah, you have zero puts it on CFS. It just politely says, wow, we know nothing's happening. Great. And then you have no screaming performance. So it raises questions like, OK, do we, do we generate or uh, yeah, retrieve fixed sets of random data that we pass to all our machines that will participate, hopefully store them in RAM that we can just quickly read from and keep ourselves on a level playing field? Because keeping things equal gets really tricky really quickly. Moving on. So naturally, we're probably using a BSD DD and a GNU DD, and maybe the algorithms are dramatically enough different that it does make a difference. Uh, one, OK, you'll see this a few times. I really want a portable BSD user land like they had from day one that's just available on instead of SIGWIN. We'll touch on SIGWIN for Windows, and you name it, all the tools, such that we can have at least the same source code, maybe with the same compiler, available on different OSs. However, having said that, when you're talking to end users on insert operating system here, they are, by definition, using insert operating system here. So if they're on Windows, and for whatever reason, their application grabs some random data, they probably use the in OS tools rather than bolt on and nerdly some little thing and install packages and like get the Unity one. So I will focus on keeping the hardware consistent and, as appropriate, everything else consistent. But yes, users have their own use case. <laughs> My working theory, keep that hardware consistent above all. Identical VMs, that's a tricky notion because they're competing for shared resources. So if one's getting preference than the others, that, that's actually probably harder to keep consistent than a bunch of machines making a ton of noise in the living room. So uh, keep the consistency to the workload and the hardware. If it's the exact same file set that's being used in your read, write, test, you name it, I think that's rather valuable. So, the Z access, open ZFS. Any users of open ZFS in the room? Okay, a few, one or two, cool. It, it took me a long time to appreciate open ZFS, but the more I use it, uh, so that minute to learn, lifetime to master a thing, I really like ZFS. I do, I do. And so, in practice, I have 10 identical machines available. By ripping apart some old left-hand undeployed NAS servers, I have identical drives for all of them, rather hot running at Kitachi, but they're identical. If you want to buy me a bunch, show say 20 SSDs that are nice and cool, give me my number. <laughs> and naturally, the other stuff I do more HVZ workstations, two PowerPC Macs, I'm babysitting one for someone in the room, and a another Xeon Mac for editing video for things like BeehiveCon, different subject. So, on the open ZFS access, there are now a surprising number of variations of FreeBSD running ZFS, which is great, which is awesome. Naturally, there's always the previous version, the current version, the development version, now the ZFS on Linux on FreeBSD version, but where it's getting exciting is NetBSD. They had a Stunningly old version for quite some time, but in eight shipped a rather a newer version. I just spoke to Chuck Silvers at this event, who is bringing it up to speed. They are basing on FreeBSD at the moment. Um, I will pay no attention to the fact that NetBSD is extremely similar in heritage and structure to OpenBSD. That's coincidental. I am well aware that OpenBSD will never officially have CFS. Don't no need to say it. That's okay. Uh, has anyone heard of Triblix? Mr. Tribble's Illumos distribution. I was delighted by it. It's no nonsense. It's simple. It's a bit like a Sun workstation and OpenCFS, and just right to the point. Uh, its own package manager built in shell with big overlays of things you might want. No beehive. So it's a bit of a deal breaker long term, but it was a really refreshing experience having never heard of it also. So OmniOS CE apparently is doing a very good job of keeping up with beehive which is also close to my heart and will eventually be part of this, but the storage is also pretty darn important. CentOS 7, okay, people want that. I'll probably throw Ubuntu into the mix. Uh, any Linux users in the room? What's the correct one? What are all the cool kids using? Arch. Arch? Okay, the very cool kids. <laughs> Day job? 
CentOS. Okay, cool. <laughs> so that was my interpretation of like, okay, I'll go install CentOS. Uh, it's rather well documented for OpenCFS. Kudos to them. But a few years back, two or so, at the OpenCFS Developer Summit, Jorgen talked about his work on Macintosh and surprised us all with the Windows situation. And he demonstrated OpenCFS on Windows 10. And following the footsteps of my Beehive work, I approached him and said, that looked cool, how do I try it? And I was the first to run it on hardware. He had been doing emulation, that, of course, that brought in new issues he had never considered, and I've been working with him to debug that moving forward. A uh, representative from Apple, either pay attention or close your ears. Uh, there is OpenZFS for Macintosh, which I've been using for many years. It's treated me extremely well on my Mac platform from the Zebo days up through OpenZFS. Uh, but when you want to have identical hardware, you are faced with a decision. Do you run everything on Mac hardware or on the hardware I just showed a photo of? And naturally, I've used all these machines for various freenas tests, and I throw 10 gig in the mix when needed. But all of that can be done in Beehive. Fortunately, all of those OSs are supported to some degree, often quite well. You've had trouble on with one? Footnote? Oh, yes, the virtual version is much quieter, I admit. So uh, I was going to joke, what's that noise? Yes, that's the wind tunnel in the office. And my wife asked, oh, someone's staying over. It's like, can you shut the thing off? I'm like, yes, I can, but uh, about 5 a.m. And then if I told you it was online, you'd want me to run some tests, but then you also want to get to the function. So it's all compromised. But Beehive supports all these very well. So in theory, Beehive could even pass through a controller card to the exact same storage, be it an array from those compelling machines we got cheap at the recycling center, you name it. So a lot of opportunities, all for very little money. So thank you, Ken. Um, in in virtual machines, okay, if you want 20 disks, thin provision. You want 20, thin provision, 10 terabyte disks that really are only just a few disk images that are a meg or two each. You can easily do that in hypervisor. But if you want to poke your nose in between that disk and the OS and by more from behind the scenes, do things like kick it in the read only mode, possibly kick in artificial smart values so to verify that your GUI that's looking at smart status. Uh, is doing the right thing at the right time with, again, that nice, quiet virtual infrastructure. The CTL utility and infrastructure in FreeBSD is your friend. And just this last 72 hours have I learned some very nice things about it, such as creating a RAM disk using its own infrastructure. It's very important that these are aligned, I learned. Uh, it will fit provision, but ZFS will really not like it. Uh, this magic, it's not many people do this, and I guess I know why. Uh, it's unusual, instead of like shipping off iSCSI, instead of shipping off Fiber Channel, which is why this thing was invented, you can just hand over a device, cutting out all the, 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 all the middle stuff. So suddenly, I've created a device, and I see the device. There it is, and I can throw things like the magical read-only mode page for that device, selectively. It is read-only for now, it's read-write. It's read-only, and you can simulate the terrible things that disks will do to you. As Jude, Jude puts it, your disks are plotting against you. Thank you, Ken, for both that command and the infrastructure. Uh, it's beautifully documented. I went to the source tree, and there's like a readme. There's clearly identified folders. I wonder what's in the NVMe folder. Well, obviously, the NVMe stuff. Very nicely done. And Mav, who I don't believe is here, has done great work keeping it up to date for, the, for his employer's purposes. Continuing, it would be great, again, to have that common POSIX environment across all these machines, be it Windows, be it Mac, be it you name it. I'd like that to be a BSD user land, given that Apple's sort of been nursing along certain ancient FreeBSD 5.1 utilities and met their needs. It's like, really? That's an old rsync you got there, but open rsync is here. Thank you, gentlemen, in the back for that. But, uh, you want the choice of all these platforms. You want to uh, take on native tools when appropriate, because that's what users do when they sit down at the thing they just bought. And then ideally to do more perfect, identical synthetic load generation, as Nick in the back room is doing quite elegantly. 
uh, you want that choice of this nice common tool set, which is hmm, going to take time to be put into place, but people seem to be rather excited about this. Has anyone tried Sigwin on Windows? I see, oh, quite a few hands, all righty. Has anyone enjoyed Sigwin on Windows? Oh, are you scratching? That's, okay, so not one hand point up. So, wow, Sigwin is a flashback. Uh, you may recall when Windows NT arrived, it's a POSIX compliant system. Great, that's exciting. All we Unix communities are like, hallelujah. And along came Sigwin in 95, and then stuff took place. Interex, services for Unix and MinGW, and then the Windows subsystem for Linux. Okay, it's not quite what I asked for, but okay, cool. And the big question, are we there yet? Because it sure feels a lot like 1995 when you use Sigma. So, there are many familiar utilities. Naturally, often GNU utilities, but often the BSD equivalent. It's great, that's awesome, I'd like to have them all. It is notably missing quite a few, which is a bit frustrating. But you can hop in there and add tools like a familiar shutdown. Smart Mon tools is very impressive. That's there, and it works. I know there's some progress by Chuck in the room to bring a smart utility to various platforms. I appreciate that. And if you want to get screen, you name it, it's out there. But so quite a few things are missing, and it still feels like it's 1995 throughout the entire process. I want a shell to work like my familiar FreeBSD machines, like C shell. Actually, on Mac and Sigwin, you can do a simple little change to your profile and get the up arrow SS for the SSH command you did like 10 minutes ago, and there it is. Yay, hallelujah. And you can do tricks to have like an actual working home directory. Most of us go into tilde, and you get your home directory. Well, you get your Sigwin home directory, which when you're running a Windows GUI and running command line, you kind of want your home directory to be the same thing. So it's, it, it seems to work to do this little trick by just kind of soft linking. And there's the, the, the bash history. And I think it was over SSH, you don't have the proper paths for your binaries identified. So you probably have to prefix them. But it smells like Unix, tastes like Unix, quacks like Unix. That's cool. Works for me. And again, here's that bash trick. That's a bash trick to act like CSH. And naturally, open up your SSH port and launch one of the many SSHDs available for Windows. Uh, so I ended up using the Sigwin one. There is now one in the GUI. With the recent Windows update, you go and enable a feature, and there it is. Real SSH from the folks in the other room. Very cool. And again, your path may not have, have uh, it be properly handed over SSH. I don't want to chase that down. Just prefix everything correctly. And finally, oh, it's been very educational. <laughs> I've learned what's going on here. It is indeed a crash dump. I've learned where that goes, what tools to open it up with, and how to analyze it and hand it over to the developer. That is documented here. This is my gift to you. That was not what I came to the party for. But there it is. I have, with the organ's help, documented Windows crash dumps. <laughs> oh, come on. DBGX. There's the tool. You lose the X. It seems Microsoft is taking over the debug tool, so it's in the store, but still is kind of on the person's web page, and it's kind of in limbo, and your mileage may vary. CDB. CDB all the way. It's still the debug toolkit. No, cool. When DBG works fine, when DBG works fine, it's all about the same tool. So it's still a Okay, I'm just giving you hell. That's cool. Moving on, I want to automate. Many of those machines have, say, Windows keys burned into them. Cool, I want to document that without leaving my desk and using my phone to get it to zoom in, try to distinguish hopefully no I's and O's and ambiguous characters like on the serial numbers, but you can do tricks with the ACPI dump. That might be, that's the good new one from ACPI tools. You can't do it in base one in FreeBSD. But suddenly you can pull out that that serial number. You can pull out those uh, the, the key, product key, and the serial number, and then start interrogating your network devices. Get those MAC addresses so you can wake them up. And it's like, okay, this is more Unixy than I expected coming into it. That's cool. And often at BSD, um, they've changed their package path, uh, package path since I worked with NetBSD a good mm, eight years ago. That's okay. I found it. No problem. 
uh, choose the right shell so you get like a backspace, you name it, and suddenly, okay, I remember my old friend NetBSD. Zen on NetBSD treated me really well. It never hiccuped. Bless their hearts. And naturally, they have a unified checksum utility, so you kind of tell it to be MD5 and do your thing, but okay, I can handle that. <coughs> Pick an Illumos, again, triplex, a really nice experience on arrival. A mix of good old Sun OS plus OpenBSD plus nothing unnecessary, which was great. However, but again, I could use Beehive. So it looks like Omni OS CE and Smart OS are the way to go for that just to get them in the mix. And I'll say, uh, again, OpenZFS and Center. This is very well documented. There was really nothing more to do than just follow what's on the wiki page. And there it is. You have OpenZFS. Then the Mac question. It's treated me very well. And in this case, I want a common hardware platform. Do I buy a bunch of Macs or do I buy a bunch of these and shoehorn Mac onto it? And so I don't know. There are lots of people with time on their hands, and they tinker, and they tinker. And I bought a lot of Apple Box licenses over the years, and I could even probably pop out a BIOS and tape it to the box and say this is a fully licensed machine. I don't know. But uh, it's an interesting community out there. That's mostly for the live stream and those in the room. So moving on, preliminary results. When you're testing a new file system like ZFS on Windows, which are words you never thought would go in the same sentence, assume nothing, truly assume nothing, having spent 10 minutes trying to debug my touch utility. I'm like, let's touch a thousand files. Um, and says, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing? No touch is broken on the file system. It's not accepting what it's throwing at it. So it's like, you're working, what's going on here? It's like, no, oh, you're right. Here, can you do this? This chip? No, it, it, it's broken. So there is no way touch could fail, but no touch failed, and that's a bug report. So again, I'm willing to put on the asbestos undergarments and try things like Beehive and OpenZFS and Windows, and hopefully provide it to the rest of you months rather than years from now. Uh, do, 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 yeah, again about NetBSD and Windows. You can't have tier two file system platforms. If you start losing data on two out of four, whatever, you name it, you poop in the zeepool and everyone loses. <laughs> so it is critical that you have a lowest common denominator and you just bring that on up to the top rather than focus on the top and uh, maybe someone will fall off the truck and fall down the mountain and hit the lower end. So I think it's important. I've got an article out there on the weakest link to that notion and the slow buffalo, the slow buffalo gets eaten because it's like behind the pack. No, can't do that. We all get to look bad if we have really broken file systems losing data for people. And we say, well, this is the greatest file system ever. So enough about that. Anyway, uh, it's strange. There is a ztest command, which is amazingly under documented. It's in FreeBSD type ztest and it does stuff. What stuff? I do not know. And there is a test suite that is in various forms of availability. Apparently, it's now in QA, KYUA, and FreeBSD. Great. Is it on Windows? I don't think so. But in the process, Windows got DTrace and other goodies. So just you know, assume nothing and dive in and just roll with it. Because these technologies are out there. And get this, the licenses are good. So uh, step one in some tooling. Thinking like the users I help with ZFS, just simple ways to, after chasing the, the Telvir bug with watching it hit a performance cliff after 10,000 files, 100,000 files, a simple utility to generate touch files or directories or both nested down to whatever depth you choose. So depth of two, two directories, width of two, two directories, and da, 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 da. option of touching a file as it goes, option of eventually copying stuff in, you name it, just to come up with a whole bunch of identical garbage data that can be shared out and then perhaps tested by various clients. This works on all of those platforms. So Nick, there you are. I look very much forward to your synthetic load generation on a budget. Is that a good way of communicating that? Uh, that's, that, that works for now. Without spend, without breaking the bank. How about that? Yes. That's important because, you know, as I have that. Emphasize, I'm not breaking the bank here. I'm so trying. I'm trying. You're trying, and <laughs> let me know what help you need. So uh, at about 4 a.m., I found that wow, if I increment those from five or to six to seven, it's almost recursively more 
uh, activity that I couldn't have in time for the talk. But going down five and across five, uh, ZO, ZFS on Linux on FreeBSD did really well. It's, I know we're only talking seconds here, but it went straight to the top there. Kudos to them. Uh, 12 beat 13 for what it's worth, but if in that narrow margin, yeah, I'll run these tests for a much longer time when I get back. Is that in variance though? Uh, it's just as it was shipped for the call for testing. Oh, that's, that's an yeah. Okay, so, oh yes, correct. Yeah, I didn't modify it, I didn't rebuild it. Yes, yeah, so right off the bat. So it probably, and again, these numbers are meaningless as one or two second apart. So I'll throw a lot more data at it, but again, I'd interrupt it so I could, one, get some sleep, two, give a talk to you today. Uh, Illumos trailing close behind CentOS. So, okay, that was a surprise. Mm, slow, but blast in the pack, but really acceptable. ARM, uh, I have not rigged up the same hard drive, but I will be able to uh, throw the exact same OS at the same hard drive for what it's worth, even though the architecture is totally different, to keep those consistent. Mac OS was a surprise. That, that for whatever reason, was off the charts. And Windows in debug mode naturally took forever, no biggie. And my NetBSD machine is not liking my script at the time, so it's not yet on the chart there. Question? Yes. Uh, so, sure. Which hardware did you wind up running macOS on? The same HPZ workspace. Okay. Yes. Let's check it. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't say it to them. I know. There, there are folks in the room who either. I'm convinced now at this rate that Apple runs its operations on other people's hardware because it works really well. Engineers are all over it and they're not building machines for engineers anymore. So it's like, what perfect match? I don't know. Just pure speculation. Pure. So. I know about ZFS, let's talk hypervisors because this is where I thought I'd start in all this, but no, getting down to the file system is pretty darn important, especially with Windows on board and NetBSD, you name it. So there was a point, naturally the Beehive folks thought, great, everyone will port Beehive. Something different took place, and we're not against that, but we suddenly got NBMM on NetBSD and VMM on OpenBSD. They're not on very yet because they're not in the OpenZFS uh, open mix. But Hyper-V has options, and even free to download headless options that you can have Hyper-V for free on your hardware with a Windows client to poke at it, and naturally Azure, you name it. But a lot of options. So uh, did anyone catch the talk just in uh, two sessions back? Uh, 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 Mirage OS, a client. Okay, I think a lot, we'll see a lot more focus on clients that can either hop in there and provide a single common VM client that uh, does say, like the Linux KVM unit tests can be available to all of those and all those various hypervisors and just exercise them. Fork bombs, other nice things. And just this week I learned that uh, the CBSD folks are working hard on 9PFS and apparently have it working and they claim it's working. And so, those patches are out there, they're not in the tree yet, but there's lots of interesting things that cross that line of hypervisors and storage because, hey, OpenZFS plus a hypervisor, it's a great thing in my humble opinion. And again, it's the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these technologies. Threads, ah, core counts are getting affordable. I, in my lab, I have up to 32, which I guess is like nothing compared to the cool kids, but with things like uh, Beehive being ported to Thunder X2, 64 core is it? That's pretty impressive. And Threadripper, Ryzen, all those becoming available, becoming affordable. Well, all those assumptions you make in programming and OSs on, say, one or two VC CPUs might break down pretty quickly. So, kudos to uh, Rod for working on the Beehive specifically, Max, via Max EPU limit, where, okay, you could have 16 vCPUs officially. If you knew what to do, you could have 21. Uh, there is code that I believe has been approved. <coughs> committed. committed. Committed to bring that up to 192, is that accurate? Yes. VCPUs individually, and I think cranked up to 255 total. So naturally in testing this, um, I cranked that on up, and here's a machine with 255 cores <coughs> in one package. Unfortunately, the, the topology is flexible. Often for licensing purposes, 
<laughs> just like, okay, fine, where you can shift those between where you need them to satisfy some bean counter somewhere, but indeed it authentically had a reacted on FreeBSD with that many CP CPUs, well, which it, the VM sees as real CPUs. Very cool. Now, even the smoke tests with other OSs got really interesting really quickly. Uh, some of them reach a certain limit and kick down to one vCPU. Just that's how they handle it. Some freak out with too many. Some two different Linuxes, CentOS versus I believe DBN proper, would boot in a matter of seconds and minutes. It's the same infrastructure they're running on and that requires some investigation. Is that the fact that that VM was given preference and the others weren't? Is that purely their architectural decisions within their OS? Because clearly Red Hat scales up to the max available. So I didn't expect to find anything interesting in testing the CPU count, but suddenly there were some surprises right off the bat. <clears throat> so then suddenly, uh, quick question, how many vCPUs does Hyper-V support? Because I have no idea. <laughs> so then it becomes, okay, if this OS behaves this way under Beehive, how does it behave under, under Hyper-V? How does it behave under NVMM, how does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Moving on from threads to versions. <clears throat> I touched on how well we generally live up near recent stable and development versions, et cetera. While it's still a valid statement, thank you FreeBSD for using SVN, which is very good about linear versioning. You know, when you hear a revision tag, you can almost get it with some experience, guess when approximately it was in history, just because it's been an increment encounter. Fortunately, the while jarring by a human allocated schedule, or at least engineering schedule, the versions are linear. They don't have funny animal names or anything. I sincerely appreciate that. And so when traveling a, an axis, a lot of it is extremely linear without big jumps. It's just like, okay, if we need to go chase a regression by tag by tag, if you're paying attention to what subsystems being modified, that's a really handy way to keep track of that. So again, gee, what comes after revision 300,000, 300,001? I can even figure that out. That's awesome. So, okay. I talked earlier about how you've got your production current day job focusing on the current release, the next release, et cetera, et cetera, and then the let's stop running this old release to then it kicks into retro computing and it's cool again. So in the course of this, I thought, okay, for kicks as I'm going back in Beehive, which I can get back to FreeBSD 5 with an NE2000 driver and a netboot, you name it. I thought, oh, I'll just go for my own purposes, go retrieve the FreeBSD history. So I went to, as everyone said, go to FTP uh, ftparchive.freebsd.org with a hyphen in there, and go retrieve it. Okay, well, I was, like those surprises on vCPU count and you name it, anything else, there were big surprises. There's, there are key releases just flat out missing there. There are checksum files that have like a number for an MD5 checksum, and it doesn't match the file that it's supposed to apply to. I'm like, that can't be good. Is it on CFS checksumming behind the scenes? I don't know, and no one answered that question. So, huge thanks, especially to Ume in, at, in the last two HBSD cons, who's been diligently collecting all these disks. He had some that I've seen nowhere else. He had 3.0, which is not shown here, but he provided me images. I thank you for that. Kirk has them, but they're shrink wrapped. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to ask Kirk to break any shrink wraps. I really don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't know if the published online ISOs are different from the Walnut Creek ISOs. I've heard they should be one and the same. If I were Walnut Creek, I'd probably put my name in it. I don't know. Yes, sir. If, if the public copies with the Walnut Creek CD ROM logo on the publication, ISO online should match. Okay. That, uh, was, that was pretty much. The answer was that the Walnut Creek ISO should be one and the same as the project ISO. Uh, that is good. Uh, when you have a few colleagues rip their CDs from way back, you get to have conversations about, like, check that 3.1 disk on your shelf for a smudge. Like, what? 
oh, you're right, your checksum didn't validate. So I'm working with a lot of people to get multiple images of the same ISO because having one checksum off what might be a mean, uh, useless disk is not super helpful. So anyway, huge thanks to all these folks. Um, I need to find a way to get these from my machine as a colo so that they can be mirrored outward. I have various people offering to do that. Hopefully the project would want to do such a thing. I don't know. I've been waiting for quite some time to hear about the person at Buffalo about hosting it at the proper FTP archive to create this unit. You know. So, continuing. As I mentioned, I can go currently as far back as FreeBSD 5.0. Uh, NetBS, uh, ATM emulation wasn't quite implemented correctly from what I can tell. However, there are ways to boot from NFS. Unix has booted from NFS forever, for as far as I'm considered, <laughs> concerned. So, uh, with the NE2000 patches out there that have been working reasonably well and some really crazy tricks to hand over and, and uh, NFS handles, I don't know who any, if anyone caught Scott's talk on uh, the new EDK2 upgrade where there's now HTTP boot and NFS support, Pixie boot support for Beehive such that, oh, this is easy, not that FreeBSD5 has a UEFA loader. But anyway, there are components there for, without a lot of trouble, you can go back in time and get to see all those errors from FreeBSD5 that you saw back in the day. It's like, oh, okay, I won't give it many CPUs. Anyway. Happy Retro Challenge. Uh, if anyone's interested in all that or has a big old pile of Walnut Creek CDs, let me know. Uh, uh, an additional rip is always good. I have a spreadsheet out there that you can look at and just say, see what's there, see what checksums are there. I do need to add sizes to that. That's, um, Pardon? A pretty good collection, but it's not complete. Early days? Early days are the trickiest ones. And one challenge, okay. There's no question that discs were really expensive back then. People just didn't keep old ISOs. I get that. That was me too. I had downloaded the ISO for like days. And you can't keep many. I get that. But we're moving to CDNs. And I'm very familiar with like jumping into ftp.openbsd.org. It's like, you know, here's everything. Right? Great. Not when it's a CDN. Suddenly it's the latest and greatest. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where did the old stuff go? Because suddenly it's very available yet only new. So I believe the Swedish mirror which has old stuff, but that was actually a policy decision by OpenBSD it was deliberate, not just space. You know. Policy to expunge the old ones? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. And the project did not want people running the old code. So Understandable. Um, is likely to move in a similar direction. Understandable, but for legal reasons alone, having the code and goodies available and occasionally binaries back from back in the day that you may need to run for whatever reason and people have the legacy applications. Just anyway, it's easier to maintain all that old stuff than it is to reconstruct it, let me tell you. Anyway, briefly on compilers, uh, I just did a quick peek and say FreeBSD ports. There are a number of versions of GCC. I sincerely hope someone's checking if the OS still builds with them. Be curious, just I don't know. It's always good to have a plan B, plan C. Uh, I see PCC is still in there, that's kind of cool. And in Tokyo, it came up that, hey, there are reasons to use a NASM a portable assembler for Haxam hypervisor because, well, it's portable. And suddenly these tools uh, begin become interesting as you diversify with various hypervisors and all this multiplicity that was not available back in the day. And there were good talk on PowerPC. 64, we're suddenly, uh oh, we need our tool chain supporting it. If we have this gorgeous hardware that we want our OS on. Ah, uh, the options framework. Um, the Docker thing. I'll take uh, a few minutes for a quick story. Uh, I'm sure everyone's heard the term RPM hell. It's come up a few times at the conference. Back in the day, you stand up a, let's just say, a Red Hat machine install some promising web app thing and there's no removing it. You need to fresh install because well, it's littered the whole file system with itself. So uh, I thought oh, this can't be right. I don't like the time it takes to, re to reinstall when all I want to do is package uninstall because maybe I got the wrong package, the wrong version, whatever. So FreeBSD jails are what brought me to the BSD community. I was sat down at it in college, not even knowing that. I was like, 
for 3 BSD, but okay. Like many people I've talked to, I sat down and did what was perfectly logical naively, which is disable all the build options and see what the minimum system looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and then you add them back as you need them. And you have a dedicated jail with your mail server and its dependencies, and maybe use LDD to just find out what it truly needs and either copy those in manually and those strategies. But oh wow, was there ever pain and suffering chasing those down. And years upon years later, I discovered uh, Paul Henningkamp's build option survey. And guess what it does? It goes with one build option and says, we run through a build world, we see if it builds, we see if it installs, we see if it does those with it included, without and install the results without requesting that, without the option set, you name it. And the survey goes through all those options, and those options have been growing. And wow, it takes about 93 hours on my <laughs> dual core Xeon Sandy Bridge machine. Um, but I've been nagging people and narrowing down which ones are broken. Some of them are ridiculously simple. Someone adds a beehive component, and they forgot to add a little without beehive to that one component because they added it to all the rest of them. It's like, oh, forgot it here, add a little make flag, make entry, and it takes care of it. A uh, huge thanks to Cut to the Chase, to Bjorn Zeeb for working on the INET ones. I know he's been concerned about saying, hey, can we build an IPv6 only system, kernel and user land? And so he cleaned up some net ones that were above my pay grade to fix. Uh, our Macklin also worked on a few. OpenSSL is still a challenge because it's got tentacles everywhere. Some of them are really straightforward. Some of them are very quote, tricky to me. <laughs> so if this interests you at all, great. But that thin jail. Any Docker <laughs> users in the room? Is there any anyone thinking that, wow, what if we just had a single application in a lightweight machine that does one purpose and is quickly spun up and destroyed and you name it? It's like, we've had the infrastructure to do that for decades. You maintain it and you get that functionality for the most part. Granted, there are a few concepts in Docker that may not be there, but that functionality has been largely available and desired. And I can say that firsthand. So please do maintain your build options if you're maintaining bits of the previous tree. And it Looking back, the conferences really do structure many of our volunteer work. It's like it's a good motivator, and I found that VHiveCon is a really good motivator to developers. It's like, hey, can you have that ready? By the that thing looks so cool. Can you show that there? Because I, I bet you can. I bet you can. And then boom, it's like yeah, okay, boom, boom, and off it goes. So it's the greatest form of arm twisting just to have these events with all the wonderful people and getting answers. To questions at every every few minutes in the hallway. So, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone. Deadlines drive delivery, and the conferences are really good ones, especially if you have a talk to give. Future tooling to really automate this further. And I know this is an interest of interest to you. Uh, GNU Parallel has long been out there to like do multiple things in, in, in line. Uh, Andrew Fresh is here, and he's got some team ups tricks to just run the same command on a bunch of machines. That's kind of the approach I'd be after. Just real simple. Just I, I just want to see that this list of things is shot out to those machines. We're not talking fancy clustering. I just want the same command run, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you will always find quirks as simple as DD wants to uh, dash block size big M or little M. It's like oh right, I forgot that one needs that one. Which gets back to do you embrace the native tools or do you uh, go with a lovely portable BSD user land, that would be awesome. So you have one genuinely same utility, hopefully built with the same compiler, and off you go. So it's, it's definitely a journey. Uh, so smart control, I've spoken at a few events about the future smart utility, and uh, who's parsing smart output? Anyone? Anyone? One? Only one? Okay. Anyway, we all have our tricks for extracting information out of smart. <coughs> and the time utility behaves a little differently on every single event. So thank you, Chuck. Uh, 
uh, he gets it and thought, wow, okay, let's do a permissively licensed smart utility that can be included in a BSD base. And as it turns out, uh, a, a very kind streaming related person from the conference is like, oh, we run smart control on our drives every five minutes. It's like, wait, that retrieves stuff that's cached in the OS. You don't need to poke and grab and repeat all that every five minutes. So by just stepping back and looking at the problem and the workload, you name it. Did we hear why the one disk would perform better with smart running, like the, the utility running, because they're just a quirk foot? There is weird stuff, and those, these, these rocks need to be lifted, and you need to take a peek and see what strange stuff is out there, because you will be surprised. Thank you. So don't pound too hard. And if you want one value, temperature, let's just say, go get the one value. Don't exercise the entire thing. You know it's serial number already. You don't need to retrieve that. And I have a shell-based prototype for what I call P-time, a precision time tool. When I do the time of a utility, I want it to spit back seconds or nanoseconds, not some complex mix, depending on the OS you're on. So things as simple as throwing out a Unix epoch date, throwing out uh, the G date, of course, has nanoseconds and milliseconds. So it should be pretty implement, easy to implement in uh, C. You've got one? No. Oh, okay. In C, yes. OK. So it, that's a, a little pet project I have a few folks interested in. Oh, the, where things really didn't go well, I was hoping I'm ready for this uh, without OpenSSL. Again, it needs some love as a build option. But with that in place, FreeBSD will be pretty darn modular, all using 90% working plus percent working infrastructure that's been maintained for decades. So maintenance, it's a good thing. I could not get macOS to run under Beehive. There are legends and stories and you name it out there about doing that. But I, I took my Hackintosh knowledge to it and could not get too far. But uh, I will try the debug UEFI code from Scott, who happens to be in Portland. And maybe we'll talk in person at least to just get some more ideas. But yeah. And I couldn't build FreeBSD 8 PCC on 11.2 just to think, OK, I knew it could be built back in the day with that compiler. Can it still? Maybe I need to jail it. I don't know. But no OpenZFS platform left behind, please. It will hurt all of us if we have OpenZFS platforms that lose people's data. It just flat out will. And the headline beats all the technical facts behind it. So in all of this, one of my key motivations, <coughs> once again, is keeping those regressions from ever surfacing. It's affordable to test the stuff. And kudos to those with the IX team who are now very serious about that. Good work. I'm very pleased to see that. I'll say about the 15th time that portable BSD user land, that's been a need since day one when they requested that from Berkeley. I don't know how that fell off the priority list, but it's really still needed. And of course, for the purpose of Unix everywhere, I still am a believer that that's how the future will look, phones and all. So epic thanks to many are in the room. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Uh, John, who's at the conference, uh, he's been remarkably helpful in Beehive earlier than expected with like the assembler, which you need to support the, the instructions for Beehive, that support Beehive, you name it. Chuck Tuffley, thank you so much. Your work on Smart and NVMe has been awesome. And uh, go check out his talk. He showed uh, using Wireshark to listen to NVMe calls live and to potentially filter them. It's like, ooh, extra revision. Very cool. Jorgen Lundman, who's done CFS on Mac OS and Windows. He's been great to work with. Rodney, for work on Smart early on, of like, well, here are the problems, here's what's going on, for the work on the on the virtual CPUs, you name it. Uh, lab assistant, Connor Bay, who was up with us at Linux Fast Northwest, he gave a great talk on FreeNAS and PFSense, and Deb was blown away from the foundation. And it's, it's that's what new community members look like, be it people at vendors who just dive in and get to learn a few things, or students who work really hard. And Alexander Moulton, naturally, who's done major heavy lifting in the CTL stack and all things EFS, and bless his heart. And I've tried to do the, the, the beehive form there for my little uh, Benny beehive con <laughs> mascot there. So my thanks to you. I hope this inspires you. I hope this gives you ideas. I'm welcome your ideas. I'm looking for those missing disks because there are clearly people who couldn't care less about all versions of software, but then there are those who uh, think it's cool from a retro computing perspective and those who may realize we have to 
go chase down software for a legal investigation to just get that chain of, you name it, all straightened out. So I still see value in that kind of stuff. Any questions for me? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm doubtful about your strategy of cutting out your license and pasting it to the, but uh, <laughs> they, 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 don't, they don't pay me enough to care about that. Right? Okay, cool. I, I would be curious to know if you have problems of either false positives or just infrastructural issues, in particular tracking head, right? Because you're super interested in regressions in open ZFS, and yet you're also testing against a moving target. Perhaps we can speak to that. So the question is about false positives in chasing moving targets. And moving target is actually the perfect term, even for derivative OSs and storage OSs based on the operating system. Uh, as I touched on, definitely when virtualized, you are surrendering so many typically static and fixed resources to a virtualized mush where you have all your storage from all your VMs competing in some way, uh, I think you're almost guaranteed to encounter very false positives where you may want to start there and push to hardware as quickly as possible. Um, uh, continuous integration is a hot topic. I sure hope people are only building with the effect the modified components rather than, oh, someone made a document that and lets somebody build the whole OS and yeah, okay. Um, thinking what other, whenever there's a, a, a highly surprising anomaly like CentOS taking seven minutes to boot on a multi vCPU system, uh, that can't be right because they, they probably spend more money than anyone on supporting large multi core hardware. So. Uh, right off the bat, my thing is just rerun it a bunch. Let it run all night. I get to sleep, and it gets to like crunch away. See what's waiting in the morning. Um, as for chasing head, that's going to get really interesting with the what looks like a shift to a different code base, hopefully a unified code base for ZFS. And turns out, perhaps after discussions this week, PF. And well, just roll with it and keep testing. Unfortunately. Full circle, the, the hardware resources and the software resources are plentiful. And I, if you have, say, an emulated network card in Hyper-V that is more accurate to your use case and that's what you're testing, use Hyper-V. I, I won't fault you. Use whatever tool is available to you because that one's available for free. Hyper-V is available as a you know, downloadable ISO. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Cool. Others? I'm generally easy to find. Bring me your blog mail, hate mail, you name it. And thank you so much. Enjoy the auction.